sure that your blending is also consistent. Or if you blend the green coffee before you roast it, that's going to be uh, very critical, like we said earlier, when it hits the roaster. What's really important when we talk about coffee is uh, coffee quality is this classification system. So there's such a thing we understand as green coffee defects. We have category one defects and category two defects. And really, I just want to introduce these as a concept. Uh, they're not required uh, to understand or to repeat this information at the foundation level. But um, in the international and professional, it will very much be. So beans classified within category one, or defects rather, category one, are the worst. Category two defects are minor. They're not quite as significant as category one. So right alongside sizing the beans, uh, which will be done in various ways uh, in this process, the coffee should be graded to establish what quality standard the crop or sample falls into. And if you're finding defects, especially category one defects, um, that may not classify then as specialty coffee. Specialty coffee will uh, allow for a few category two defects, but not a single category one defect. So grading our coffee by size and defect before it's shipped out, before it's sold, and then according to cupping quality, which is really the inner beauty of the bean. So, you know, maybe outside it's not the biggest bean or it's not the most beautiful, but maybe it cups really nice. Likewise, you can have a beautiful looking coffee that just is not pleasant to drink. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but understand that growing conditions can introduce disease or weather damage. Harvesting conditions, it might be too wet or too dry. The storage might be bad. Processing methods, if your processing time is wrong, or if the storage and uh, you know removal or the use of water, um, processing methods can introduce a lot of these defects. And then shipping control, so the bags that you use, whether you're using burlap or moisture uh, is in your bag, uh, if you have Grain Pro, all of these things can introduce or uh, exacerbate some of the Category 1 and Category 2 defects. Okay, so for example, um, what would frost what kind of effect would that have on a coffee plant or the coffee fruit? Frost, of course, would kill a plant and it can damage the plant. It can also damage the fruit. If you're seeing in there, um, in your batch of beans, if you're seeing black beans. Okay, so these were probably damaged at, on the plant. Um, these would be uh, frosted or diseased, rotten uh, when they were on the plant or shortly afterward when they were picked from it. And then what effect would the frost have on the coffee or cherry? Well, we just said there, uh, especially in the black, black beans. Okay, what about decaf, decaffeinization? We're doing good. We're, there's a lot of content here. We're getting close to, uh, I don't know, 80% point. So decaffeination, um, we won't, I'll try not to go too deep here because this really isn't critical for the foundation level, but you can remember our happy goat story, right? So uh, Arabica coffees, um, by a species, they have a specific range of caffeine content within them. And typically, if you think of 100% of that coffee bean, only 1 to 1.5% 1 of it is caffeine. Okay, so there's a whole lot of other stuff. There's 99% other stuff in that coffee bean, maybe 1% caffeine, 1 to 1.5. Now here we have the Canifora Robusta, and you can see it's really almost twice as much, uh, 1.5 to 3.0. And I'm sorry for Arabica, I was looking at my notes, not at the screen. Uh, 0 0.08, it can be lower than 1 to 1.5, and Canifor Robust is twice that, 1.5 to 3 percent. All right, so um, caffeine was first discovered and isolated in 1820 by a scientist named Rung. And again, this isn't on the exam, but it was first successfully recorded as uh, coffee was decaffeinated in 1837 by Roselius. Now, these were a couple of scientists that were trying to figure out just where and how this caffeine works. Today, this is a big business, right? Just look at Red Bull and energy drinks and Coca-Cola. Where do you think they get all their caffeine? It's being extracted from someplace, and there's a big market for 
caffeine that's derived from coffee. Now, uh, there are required minimum contents by location in order to classify something as decaf. So, of course, Europe and America, we have to have a different standard. So Europe classifies by how much is remaining in that coffee. So remember we said Arabica has 0.8 to 1.5%. So if you remove, let's say, 0.7 to 1.4%, and there's a maximum of 0.1 remaining, okay, do the math real, real quick, follow me there. If just a little bit of that coffee remains, then you can say it's decaf. So imagine though, you've got a cup of coffee and it's Arabica and it starts with 1% caffeine and you remove 0.9%. Well, it's still got a tenth of a tenth of a percent of caffeine in it. So if you drank 10 cups of decaf, it would just be like drinking a normal cup of coffee. That's in European countries. Now in America, it's, uh, it's a little smaller under 3% of the original caffeine content remaining, okay? So whatever that original content number was, if it was 1% or 1.5%, under 3% of the original caffeine. So who cares if it's Arabica or Robusta at this point? Uh, in your cup of coffee in America, if there are, uh, let's just say this is a huge cup of coffee or super shots, and uh, there was 100 milligrams of caffeine in it, so if you removed 97 milligrams and you had uh, one, two, or three milligrams of caffeine remaining in it, then you could call it decaf. Now, that's actually a lot less than, uh, more strict than the European country standard. Now, if you weren't too confused by that last slide, this next one will certainly kill you. And again, this is, uh, this is intermediate content, so I'm going to move real quick here. But basically, how does decaffeination work? There are four main decaffeination methods. And on the left here, we have the Swiss Water Process logo. They're one of the most famous. They've done a great job branding. Uh, it just feels good, and it is one of, one of the most healthy options for decaffeinated coffee. But basically, you use a solvent, okay, which is a liquid, and a washing liquid, and uh, some kind of a osmosis or pulling extracting process. Okay, so there are four ways listed here. Supercritical carbon, CO2 process, uh, dichloromethane process, DCM, ethyl acetate process, EA, or H2O, water process. So if you really want to start memorizing for your intermediate, you can try to remember the CO2, DCM, EA, and H2O. We all memorize it at some point. Now, Here's what we do. Discussing the implication of Swiss water process. We'll use Swiss water, but really any of these, especially if you have uh, dichloromethane, okay, you see the keyword there, methane, and ethyl acetate, you see the keyword there, ethyl, that's an alcohol. Those two and three, those are the least, uh, you see, those are the cheaper, more uh, old school. They're the least sought after um, from a health or flavor perspective. But um, looking at Swiss water. We would soak a batch of beans in hot water. Uh, next, we would absorb all the flavors but leave behind only the caffeine. Okay, this is a scientific process. And then on C, we would throw out the first batch of flavorless beans. Okay, D, we would introduce a brand new batch of beans to the caffeine deficient solution of water. So that is going to act like a magnet to extract only the caffeine. Remember, we threw away those beans originally that had everything sucked out of them except the caffeine. So now, introducing a new batch of beans to a solution, which is going to pull everything, osmosis, except that, uh, or rather, it will not pull anything, ideally, except the caffeine. And then, we're going to repeat that process over and over again, reusing that water solution for the new beans. Okay, so there's loss of beans here. Sometimes you'll notice decaf coffee is more expensive than regular coffee because there's waste also involved. All right, I told you we weren't going to stay long there, and I stayed longer than I wanted. All right, coffee is among the top five globally traded commodities. It moves so many hands, between so many hands, in so many places all over the world, 
it's a highly traded commodity. And how is it most commonly shipped around the world? What do you think? By airplane? Wrong. By boat, right? These are huge volumes. They're shipping from all over the world, especially um, South America and Africa. So we're shipping these by boat all over the world. And there are coffee futures trading markets. Now, there are two main markets in the world, uh, New York and London. And New York is kind of the home to Arabica coffee futures and London is the home to Robusta Coffee Futures. Okay, so what is a futures contract? We won't go too deep into it here, but at the intermediate and professional level, you should know. Coffee Futures is a way to uh, purchase a guaranteed price or a type of coffee in the future for a guaranteed price. Why is that important? If you're a big company, you need to make sure that next year and the following five years, you can maintain your espressos, you can maintain your blends, you can meet your profit margins and uh, profit expectations. So you need to buy on future contract. This is a common commodities and agricultural method that we use for production and manufacturing. And if you wanted to do it for your Arabica, you'd have to, those contracts would run through New York. And if you did it for Robusta, those contracts would run through London. So you must recognize third party certifications. What are the goals for these certifications? What do they do for the coffee industry? Third party certifications like Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, and UTS certified are just that, third party, which means it's neutral, right? It's not biased. But you'll also hear of other certifications and value schemes to add value to the coffee. You'll hear of Shade Grown or USDA Organic or Quality Safety, Bird Friendly, Direct Trade, Sustainably Grown, and even brand specific. Um, you know, Starbucks might have their own type of certification or Illy or Intelligentsia or Stumptown. You know, you could go any country in the world, you could find uh, number one, number two coffee trading companies and they'd have their own certification that they like to stamp on other coffee. So what's third party? Um, what they're trying to do is independently, so they're not financially involved or financially motivated like the U.S. Department of Agriculture would be motivated, or in China the quality safety seal would be um, motivated because it helps them personally, their nation. These third parties are independently guaranteeing that specific rules and voluntary standards are being met by producers and those in the supply chain. Okay, so for example, um, <clears throat> so for example, I don't like my example here, I'm not going to read that. So for example, a third party certification like fair trade. Okay, so this is an outside body that's going to make sure that. Um, the coffee is moving through the supply chain and that farmers are being treated fairly and being paid a fair price right for their coffees and so they're not going to make the the fair trade coffee association the alliance is not going to make more money if they get more people in fair trade or less people in fair trade um, you know they're not financially motivated as a third party what about rainforest alliance okay they're going to be looking at um, protective measures to make sure that the rainforest is protected and that uh, you know ecological processes are being used. So uh, these are good to study online. Um, these two are also continually evolving, but the main goal is to understand that third party nature of those.